Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 10743 in the name of Graeme Day on support for the veterans and armed forces community. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Minister Graeme Day to speak to and move the motion around 12 minutes please Minister. Is the Minister's card in? Could we have the Minister's the microphone, please? Could we have the Minister's card in the right way? Could, could the Minister, I'm terribly sorry, could the Minister maybe just move along one to the left or right to see if that helps? Ah. It's the tech. Sorry about that, Minister. Please. Eventually, President Officer, um, I'm delighted to uh, present today the Scottish Government's seventh annual update to Parliament on support for the veterans and armed forces community in Scotland, and I move the motion in my name. This year's update is particularly special for myself, as it's the first since I began my second stint as the Minister responsible for veterans' role, which I was honoured to return to some six months ago. Since 2017, members of the Scottish Parliament have gathered annually to reflect upon the work being done in Scotland to improve support and access to services for our veterans, their families and the wider armed forces community. You will have heard my predecessor and I say this before, and I know these phrases can sometimes sound quite trite, but as a government we are truly committed to ensuring our veterans and their families are not disadvantaged because of their service in the armed forces, and we really do want Scotland to be their destination of choice when they leave the military. And I know from previous iterations of this debate that's an aspiration shared across the Chamber. Today we published our annual report which details fully the work we've undertaken over the past 12 months and I'm sure members will already have read that cover to cover. This debate also takes place against the backdrop of the Veterans Commissioner's own assessment of progress made against their recommendations. Returning to the role as Minister for Veterans, I've been struck by two things. Firstly, the continuing dedication of our veterans' charitable sector, without which Scotland could not make the offering it does. But secondly, the impact of COVID and the cost of living crisis, which has set new challenges for the delivery of support, along with the income streams of the organisations at the forefront of providing some of it. On a personal note, it's been good to meet up again with some familiar faces. I was pleased to be asked to speak at a Veterans Housing Scotland event in Glasgow City Chambers in June. In July, I visited Erskine's Veterans Village, followed by an absolutely brilliant visit to Scotland's bravest manufacturing company. And last month, I was hosted at HMP Shots, where I met some of the veterans there, uh, individuals in custody, and uh, unveiled a fantastic painting at the entrance to the prison's remembrance area. Second officer, I was also humbled to be able to attend this year's memorial gathering with the McRae's Battalion Trust at Conto Maison in northern France to honour those who fell during the Battle of the Somme and to participate in marking the 70th anniversary of the Korean War at the Scottish Korean War Memorial, a really peaceful and beautiful setting in the Bathgate Hills. We should never forget such sacrifices, and in that context, can I pay tribute to my predecessor, Keith Brown, who was behind the Scottish Government launching this year the medals replacement scheme under which we, we will fund the cost of replacing lost or stolen medals for eligible veterans resident in Scotland. Presiding officer, collaboration is essential to ensuring that different organisations, each of whom can bring something unique to the table, can come together to deliver a coherent approach to support and services. That's all the more important in the current financially challenging circumstances. The Scottish Government has sought to encourage collaboration through our annual £500,000 Scottish Veterans Fund, which I was delighted to launch at Community Veterans Support in Glasgow earlier this year. We further demonstrated our support for collaboration by agreeing to fund the Unforgotten Forces Consortium to support older veterans for an additional three years. This year's Veterans Fund prioritised support in the face of the cost of living crisis and for early service leavers. In total, 17 projects have been funded for 2023-24 six of which offer support to veterans impacted by the cost of living crisis and two supporting early service leavers. This year I also welcomed the publication of Lord Etherton's LGBT Veterans Independent Review which examined the effects of the pre-2000 ban on homosexuality in the UK Armed Forces. The review is an emotive and at times extremely difficult read, but it's hugely important that people have had the opportunity to share their experiences and I want to acknowledge the bravery of those who did. It's now imperative that action is taken on the report's recommendations and we're looking closely at how best to deliver on the two suggestions directed at Scotland, 
which are around diversity and inclusivity for health care and housing providers to ensure that veterans do not face any repeat of the homophobic policies they suffered in the armed forces. Mr. I will talk more about the future work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner later, but I was pleased to see her annual progress report published last week. It is important to note that Susie Hamilton highlighted that we are making encouraging progress in a number of areas, notably health and well-being and employability and skills. And we must not lose sight of the excellent work um, and the Commissioner's recognition of the efforts we continue to make in driving forward on the outstanding recommendations. However, a key function of the Commissioner's role is to offer object objective scrutiny. We must therefore acknowledge her areas of concern. This year, Susie Hamilton highlighted two such areas, the pace of delivery of the Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan and the Veterans Homelessness Prevention Pathway. On the former, she noted recent encouraging progress and members will know that a board was established to take forward an implementation plan. We look forward to receiving a fully developed and costed plan from the board this month. We are grateful for the work of the board members and the implementation team to date as we continue to prioritise the delivery of high quality mental health services for veterans in Scotland. It is also important to remind members that we continue to jointly find the veterans first point, uh, fund rather, the Veterans First Point Network, which offers a one-stop shop for veterans. We have provided £1.4 million of funding for specialist and community outreach services uh, through combat stress every year since 2018-19. I am also pleased to say that we have already progressed elements of the recommendations in the Veterans Homelessness Prevention Pathway. Uh, absolutely. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful for the Minister to give way and can I also pass on my compliments to him for arranging the round tables across all parties in this, in this Parliament to allow um, problems and communications to pass more quickly than perhaps um, would otherwise happen. But would you also join with me um, in complimenting um, Forces Children Scotland and particularly the role that um, young people have who are um, children of veterans and children of forces and I wonder whether he's going to be able to deal with some of the challenges that they as a specific group face um, later in his speech. Minister. Uh, President Officer, I think all voices should be heard uh, in the context of support for um, armed forces uh, services and their family. And um, if, if the member is going to cover that in his speech, I'll be happy to pick up on that in, in due course. I will cover a degree of that as we move forward. Um, on the subject of the, the, the homelessness situation, the Minister for Housing is actively considering where appropriate opportunities exist to raise the profile of veterans' housing and homelessness as part of his regular discussions uh, with organisations such as the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and COSLA. And the Minister has offered to meet the Commissioner to discuss this further, demonstrating I think, our cross-government commitment to veterans' issues. And we will, of course, continue to prioritise the delivery of the outstanding recommendations. Saying, officer, ensuring veterans and their families move into meaningful, fulfilling employment after service continues to be a top priority. This year saw so the launch of the military schools discovery tool uh, and skills the discovery tool apologies and we remain committed to employing more veterans in the Scottish Government. I'm delighted that veterans are now guaranteed an interview if they apply for a job in the organisation and meet the role's minimum criteria. And this, long, this year we also launched a campaign working with the business community to help employers further understand the benefits that veterans bring to the workforce. Looking at veterans' health care, the pilot of the Armed Forces and Veterans uh, General Practice Recognition Scheme was a trial for three months this year across nine health board areas, and we are using the feedback from the trial to further shape the scheme ahead of its national rollout later this year. Um, obtaining greater data on the veterans' community is also a key priority, and I will talk more about this in closing, but we are expecting veterans-related data from the census question next year and findings from three Scottish Government major household surveys and the UK-wide Veterans Survey this year. Presiding officer, though, it is vitally important not to lose sight of the challenges that can be faced by the families and veterans of, serving, uh, of veterans and serving members of the armed forces. We are removing the barriers that some service families uh, face in accessing funding for further education, and we continue to fund the National Education Officer to provide advice and data on the needs of service families in education in Scotland. Despite the important work we are doing to support veterans and their families, it is crucial to remember that they are ordinary citizens like you and I, and the overwhelming majority leave the armed forces, integrate into society perfectly well, and go on to lead positive and fulfilling lives. They get a good job, they find a suitable house, and access to appropriate health care. We must continue, all of us, to challenge the outdated perception 
that veterans are somehow damaged by their experiences or are incapable of living a normal life like everyone else. This is simply not the case, and it's important to remember that. There should be much greater focus on the huge contribution veterans and their families make to the fabric of Scottish society and communities across this nation. And I hope that members in their contributions are able to balance the support that the minority of veterans may need with the positive impact uh, that the overwhelming majority uh, make. I want to highlight some of those many veterans who have transitioned from the military into civilian life in Scotland, uh, in Scotland with immense success. For example, Scott Simon, an RAF veteran of 20 years who has gone on to elite Olympic and Paralympic coaching, chairing Scotland Rugby League and latterly was CEO of Snowport Sports Scotland. Or Leslie Speedy, a former Army Corporal who volunteered as community first responder with the Scottish Ambulance Service then during the pandemic, uh, developed a community response hub and now chairs the Blackwood and Kirkmuir Hill Resilience Group, while also studying community response and recovery from cr uh, crisis at university. They are just two examples, and there are many more I could give, and I am sure members across the Chamber could do the same. Our veterans, their families and service families continue to contribute a huge amount to our society, and I remain committed to providing the very best support for them. President Officer, can I um, uh, offer on behalf of the Government our personal thanks to all of the individuals and organisations who have contributed to the efforts during the past year and those who continue to work hard every day to support our veterans and armed forces community. And I look forward to the contributions of members and responding to these in due course. Presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. I would take this opportunity to advise members that there is a bit of time in hand, uh, should members wish to uh, make uh, and take interventions. And I call uh, Edward Knighton. Mr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And I'd like to say that I actually fall into that cat category as a veteran. Um, I always struggle saying that because I, it makes me feel old. But I, and I'd like to class my... Well, I am, OK, uh, presiding officer. I see some members saying that. Um, but I'd prefer to be called an, an ex-soldier, perhaps. And, but th those of us on these benches over here are happy to support the motion today, uh, pleased to be able to also contribute to it and, and to feed into it as the Minister was drafting it up. And, and I would like to say that we too share the view that veterans bring a huge amount to society in Scotland. But before I say any more about uh, veterans, I'd like to pay tribute to our armed forces. We should never forget that veterans probably have served in conflicts around the world and they allow us to sleep safely in our beds at night. And they've never ever, as far as I'm aware, as soldiers or sailors or airmen or whatever, challenged uh, the fact that they might have to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And I also want to acknowledge those that will always remain on duty, having paid that price. I have to say, presiding officer, I am slightly disappointed that there are no Greens in the chamber to contribute uh, to this debate. Uh, they are quick to accept the safety that our service personnel bring and I think it would be better if they were here to participate in it. Moving on to the Veterans uh, Commissioner's report. I would take an intervention. Thank, thank you Christine very much Graham. Uh, Mr Mountain. Just to make it clear I am a pacifist but it doesn't make me anti-army. I just want to put that on the record. I support the army. I'm anti-war which is a very different matter. Edward Mountain. And, and thank you. And I know Christine Graham's position. And, you know, in the 12 years that I, that I was a soldier, I did all sorts of things. Mainly, a lot of them were supplying food to refugees and looking after refugee camps, which is not all about active soldiering, which I know, Mr. Brown, I pay tribute to him for, for the work that he did in the services. So some of us contributed in other ways. Um, and I believe that's why the armed services are vitally important. I'd like to, at the outset, also thank the Veterans Commissioner for all that she has done uh, since she's been appointed and all the veteran commissioners that preceded her. I think their job is incredibly important. Uh, I do support the 81 recommendations, as I know the government did, and uh, I'm pleased to see 35 have been achieved. Uh, I, I think this is a wonderful euphemism, perhaps, 21 absorbed into other outcomes. Uh, I'm sure I understand that but it still means there's 25 still to be delivered, and we should work on those. And I also welcome from the Scottish Government the Veterans Fund that they've uh, uh, made and, and created. 
Of course, the minister would expect me to say this, that I expected and would hope it was bigger. Uh, and in the return, the minister would turn around, as they always do, and say, and where should that money come from? And of course, my answer would be that I think veterans are vitally important and we ought to consider them before we consider overseas trips and doing things overseas. But there are a lot of good things uh, that I think the government has done. I think the recruiting website is a great idea. Uh, it not just talks about skills that soldiers bring and we can use that. We can talk about the leadership they bring and the fact they're used to making decisions and they quietly get on with the job. So I think that recruiting website will allow that to come across. I also like the welcome to Scotland and the stopping social isolation. Also, actually, truthfully, like as well the fact that the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, where ad an additional 40 military skills have been taken into account and recognised. I think it's really important to remember all these things. Um, where work is still required, though, uh, I would like to say uh, a little bit about resettlement. Uh, be under no illusion that leaving the armed forces is unsettling. And uh, it can be very difficult. And it's difficult to say, as they say in the report, that there needs to be claimed ownership by the people that are leaving. You are actually, in many cases, leaving your family, leaving the organisation that you've worked with day and night, uh, leaving your friends, who not only do you work with, you socialise with. And it, there is a huge need to do quite a lot before you leave, during the, fact, the time that you're leaving, and to be helped settle in afterwards to the communities you move to. I'm glad things have changed. I will give way on that. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Edwin Mount um, for giving way. And indeed, last night, there was a, a, a very powerful reception here organised by Forces Children and indeed Alexander Stewart. One of the things that the young people spoke about is the challenge that their parents and carers had in transitioning out of the armed forces, particularly with regard to housing, and particularly with the practicalities of, indeed, how you even go about renting, when prior to that, all accommodation had been provided. Edward Mountain. And I, I, I think the member must uh, have read my speech. I hope I didn't <laughs> leak it. Uh, but uh, just, I'm going to come to that, if I may. But I think the, the point is, is things have moved on from the days when I left the army, when I was given £500 for a resettlement course and, and four days to get out of my house. Things have moved on from that, but it is deeply unsettling, and we do need to do more. And I think the army could do more, the services could do more. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, there should be a better focus on resettlement, and I think that in Scotland we could do more to help people settle in. I am running short of time. How much time have I got? Uh, plenty of time. A little bit. Okay. Minister. Uh, two points, uh, and I don't disagree with much of what Edward Mountain said. Um, I, think, I think he would agree, I hope, that one of the things we can do is raise awareness amongst the serving military about the ability to earn housing points, for example, while still serving. There is an issue about awareness of what's on offer. And would he also agree with me that one of the issues we have is, and this is a good thing, that many people leave the army in one part of the UK to move to another. Many of them come to Scotland. And there is an issue about making them aware of what's available in the country they are moving to. Edward Mountain. Thank the Minister for that intervention. I, I, I think it's right. And I think the MOD have a role to play in, in housing and helping people into housing. And I have... Uh, badgered my colleagues uh, down south about getting the MOD to make houses available to allow people to move to the area where they want to settle in and those MOD houses should be made available for a period of time while people get the opportunity to find alternative housing and I know there's work done on it but I also need to think we could do more and, and I find it deeply disappointing uh, that there are empty service uh, accommodation across Scotland but there are problems which uh, I'm sure members will be aware about leases and sorting that out. And I think we need to all work together on that. I would just say on homelessness, it's not just also about homelessness, it's about being providing substandard accommodation. And the minister helped me uh, this year uh, re-house somebody who was in totally unsuitable housing uh, and, and frankly was a disgrace. And, and, the, and the council, when pushed, um, reacted quite hard. Uh, the other thing I would just say on medical, I think there's a lot more that we could do. 
on the medical support that we give our soldiers. We need to be uh, aware that uh, some, some of their medical records may not be as complete as other people's medical records for very good reason. And I do believe that there's the ability to claim back medication as a result uh, that's required as a result of their service from the UK government. I'm not sure we do that in Scotland. Should we be doing it? Uh, because there is a fund to allow us to do that. Uh, so I'm told, Minister. So where, where are we now? I don't know. Have I got a, how much more time have I got? Uh, I can give you a couple of minutes. Mr. Okay, Mr. Officer. Thank you. Where are we now? And I think the point is, is, is that the Minister mate, our soldiers do integrate. It was not that long ago I was in uh, King Usi delivering leaflets, bizarrely enough, and I didn't notice the ambulance that came up behind me and almost nudged me before it put its sirens on. I tell you, I've never jumped so quickly in all my life to find that it was an ex-trooper that I'd served with in the army. And bizarrely enough, not long later, I was stopped by a traffic policeman uh, with all the lights going, which of course made my heart rush uh, to find that it was an ex-sergeant who'd served with me and was paying me back for something I'd said to him many years ago. And, you know, these things happen, yeah. He didn't charge me. I had, I had my MOT and insurance. And, and, and I would also say that I've met soldiers uh, that I served with uh, driving lorries uh, for big stores. So we do reintegrate and reintegrate very well. And, I, I mean, the fact that there are two veterans in this parliament probably proves that, I would say, as well. So, in summary, I think soldiers do fit in, uh, and sailors and all servicemen and women, but we do need help when we're moving. Um, we do bring huge skills uh, to uh, Scotland when we, when we come here and come to live here, even if it's returning home. And those skills include leadership, the ability to solve problems, I think diligence in the workplace, hard work on, on, in nearly all occasions, and loyalty. And that's why I think, as a country, Scotland should welcome veterans with open arms, because I think they make a huge contribution to the communities they join. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. And I now call on Paul Sweeney, who's joining us remotely. Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to be opening for Labour in today's debate on the Government motion on support for the Veterans and Armed Forces community in Scotland. And I thank the Minister for advance sight of the Veterans Annual Report and, and welcome him back to his appointment, which I know he takes um, you know, care of and with great diligence. Um, it is important that we work cross-party in the interests of those who serve and have served our country, particularly as they transition back to civilian life. And I think Sir Edward, the member for, a Conservative member for Highlands and Islands, spoke very powerfully about that implication and the complexities of that. But it also is a wider definition. Many of our veterans are actually reservists who live in our communities and have all along, uh, but they also have complex experiences, not least in recent years with operations uh, overseas um, and the complexities of dealing with trauma and grief associated with those operational deployments. As my party spokesperson for veterans and the armed forces in Scotland, I am in regular contact with veterans and their families, with the third sector organisations providing support and other stakeholders. And through that invaluable engagement, I'm constantly learning and developing an understanding of the issues facing veterans, armed forces personnel and their families and the realities of their day-to-day -day lives. Indeed, just uh, this week, I had the privilege, along with parliamentary colleagues, of visiting Glencorse Barracks in Midlothian, which is home to the Army's Initial Assessment Centre for Scotland and Northern England, as well as the Royal Highland Fusiliers, 2nd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Scotland, led by Commanding Officer Lieutenant Colonel Dunn. And we were afforded a fantastic immersive insight to the full journey for the young soldier beginning an initial assessment training through to deployment on operations, indeed with a force protection company from Two Scots due to deploy to Erbil in Iraq in December for a three month period. And speaking to personnel and their families there, they shared a great pride in being part of the army and the Scots regimental family, but also shared some concerns, practical concerns regarding the costs of pursuing a career in the army and I think that is a critical consideration. How do we ensure that people are able to maintain their service for as long as they wish to do so and aren't placed in an invidious position where they have to terminate their service and perhaps prematurely become veterans? Indeed, a good example of this in discussion with um, soldiers and their families at the uh, barracks was the access to 30 hours of free childcare entitlement close to the base can be onerous and expensive. 
And I would encourage the minister to engage with the army in Scotland on this particular issue and identify a suitable way to address this concern. Because my longer term concern is if that feedback continues to get fed back to the Minister of Defence, it may adversely affect future base planning strategies and potentially further reduce the army's footprint in Scotland. Labour welcomes the progress outlined in the annual report such as the developing of the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework Partnerships Military Skills Discovery Tool and the awareness raising work on financial support available to veterans. However, the implementation must be faster in some areas, as the Minister has highlighted. The Scottish Veterans Commissioner's annual report last week noted concern at the delay in implementing the Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan, with it taking on average more than 10 years for a veteran to ask for support for their mental health. Implementing this plan is an absolute priority that we all need to take seriously to prevent people reaching a crisis point. Further, the report also highlighted and cited concern at the delay in delivering the Veterans Homelessness Prevention Pathway, stating that little has been achieved today and progress in implementing this much needed pathway is slow, with no clear milestones or timelines provided. That is despite 690 former members of the armed forces being assessed as homeless or threatened with homelessness in 2022-2023, which is an increase of 40 uh, since the previous year. The introduction of guidance such as the wellbeing plan and the homelessness prevention pathway is very welcome indeed, but these strategies need to be resourced and implemented in a timely and practical manner if they are to have their desired effects. Third sector organisations are certainly valuable in supporting veterans, armed forces, personnel and their families within their local communities. And indeed, I often cite in my own city of Glasgow, SAFA's help, uh, Glasgow's Helping Heroes um, model, which I believe is a standout example of a one-stop shop support service for veterans. Their model provides advice and practical casework benefits um, for housing and homelessness and a number of other areas such as employability and training, financial advice, and healthcare. Indeed, research from the University of Stirling and Glasgow Caledonian University found that the social return on investment for the Glasgow's Helping Heroes Service is a return of £6.63 for every £1 invested. I believe it's a one-way bet uh, for us to further look at that model and its scalability across Scotland. Further outline analysis of the pre-pandemic years placed that return figure uh, even higher at £11.68 for every pound invested. So this gateway model, I believe, is a great example of how to access support and how it should look. And I hope that there will be many other positive examples like it across Scotland. Look forward to members highlighting those as the debate progresses. I would be grateful if the Minister could outline in his closing remarks what the Scottish Government is doing to support those pockets of positive practice to learn from them and ultimately to capture them and scale them up so that all veterans in Scotland have a right to localised and effective support. The Veterans and Armed Forces community is an asset to Scottish society as I said in my opening remarks, we must work on a cross-party basis to harness their potential and ensure that they have the necessary support. That means being honest about where things are working well, but also where things could be better. I've set out some examples where progress is being made and Labour are happy to work constructively with the government on areas that need further development. And I welcome the opportunity to debate this important topic this afternoon and I confirm that these benches support both the government motion and the Conservative amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. And I now call uh, Willie Rennie, who's joining us remotely as well. Mr Rennie. Um, the Minister was right when he talked about the need to celebrate and recognise the contribution that the members and ex-members of the military make. And I think he's right about that. And I have seen some very, I've met some very talented people who've, who've made great contributions to society and to the people that they work for now. But he also knows that it's really important that this parliament focuses on what we need to do better. And there are many areas that we do need to do better because um, I've met lots of people, as I'm sure he has, who have seen horrific things in the field of combat, uh, horrific events, murders, um, um, deaths, um, very traumatic things involving people of all ages, and it lives with them forever. So we should focus on what we can do better to help these people who are really struggling to fit back into society, whilst also recognising, as he says, that there are some very many talented people who do 
great things for their employers, but also for society. I'm sorry I'm not um, with you today, but I was tested positive for COVID this morning. I know the Minister will miss me, but I thought it'd be best to speak uh, from home this afternoon. Um, the government was keen to get a consensus this afternoon, but I hope the Minister will forgive me that we tried to table amendment, uh, which was not accepted, but we wanted to press the point about pupil equity funding for pupils, for young people of children um, of armed forces and veterans. Um, it's something I'll return to uh, later on in my speech, but I think it's important to try and press the government more so that we can make some more progress on helping young people in this area. But first I want to cover a couple of things, and it's already been covered by others in their contributions already, but it's important to to emphasise what needs to improve, and it's the Veterans Commissioner's report. And the Minister was right also to recognise the criticism, and it's to his credit for doing so. But she pointed out to some successes, but also particular areas of slow progress in terms of health and employment, but also mental health and homelessness prevention require further progress. The progress on the delivery of the Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan was described as slow, and that's just not good enough. We need to move so much faster if our words are to mean anything. She said the recent updates have been more encouraging, but the government must be maintained if it's going to mean to deliver a mental health and wellbeing pathway for veterans, which is timely and effective. The commissioner was also critical of progress on the veterans homeless prevention pathway. We are more than a year on from the proposals being published, but she said that little has been achieved to date. And again, progress is slow with no clear milestones or timelines. And this is really important. And the reason is, is simple. The Scottish veterans residencies said that approximately 800 households, including veterans, make homelessness applications every year. They also highlighted that homelessness can occur many years after discharge because of delayed transition, which can be due to a reluctance to seek help or the deferred impact of a previous trauma. As much as we publicly value the service of those in the armed forces, we should also recognise that the burden also falls on their families and in particular their children. The Armed Forces Covenant says that members of the Armed Forces community should face no disadvantage compared to other citizens in the provision of public services. We should have the same commitment for their children's education. Many young people with parents in the services are forced to chop and change between schools as they move around for their parents' work. That can be disruptive to their studies and their friendships. For many, the worry of having a parent away in a dangerous place for a long time also means that they often need extra support. One of the measures I was especially supportive of when my Liberal Democrat colleagues were in government introduced was the service pupil premium in England, £335 of funding per child from the beginning of school age until 16. Funded direct to schools to support as teachers think best to give young people the extra help they need with their mental health and their schoolwork. It is clear that this funding has made a real difference for many young people. In some schools, it has been used to employ dedicated members of staff to support and mentor service children. Pupils at one secondary school said that having an interested adult mentor who understands the demands placed on service families has helped them to feel less isolated, especially when one of their parents is on deployment and has helped them to build strong friendship groups to support them with their attendance during difficult times. At primary school, the funding allows them to provide outside learning to support, to work with pupils, building on their social skills, self-esteem, and developing positive attitudes to learning, raising academic achievement. But despite the success of this policy in England, 
more than a decade on from its introduction, I have not yet persuaded the Scottish Government to support it. The numbers are significant as two and a half thousand children of service personnel living in Scotland are missing out on support. And I hope the Minister will reconsider the position, especially with his new role in education, but also with the Armed Forces community. I think we want to do right by veterans, the Armed Forces community and their children. The progress identified by the Commissioner deserves to be acknowledged, as does her criticism. But we should always ask what more we can do. And the service pupil premium is something positive that the government could do. Thank you, Mr. Rennie. And we now move to the open debate. And I call Christine Graham to be followed by Megan Gallagher. Ms. Graham. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to speak in this debate, as I have in previous similar debates. And I also have direct experience of armed forces and their families through my engagement with Glencorse Barracks in my constituency. Indeed, just this week, I was back there with other MSP, MSPs, including Mr Sweeney, uh, to visit. At one point, the barracks were threatened with closure by the MOD, but that has now been reprieved. I would add that Penacookians very much support the barracks, which is integral to the community, and of course, the children all attend local schools. Although the visit this week was generally to be briefed about the diverse and challenging role of the army these days and the processes for recruitment, it also involved discussing, as it should, the pressures on personnel returning home from a tour, the pressures on partners and families, and then finally on discharge. To put some context on specific pressures on armed forces, I spoke to one serving officer who began his service as a teenager in Northern Ireland, then had tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, returning to home, not only where there may be a partner who has been running the household single-handed for months, bringing its own challenges for both, this is compounded if there are young children who are unfamiliar with their returning parent, and that parent perhaps bearing the imprint of terrible sights and sounds which have to be sanitised in our news bulletins. Indeed, I learned there is a two-week decompression process, so that the returning from conflict, despite understandable desperation to go straight home, that time, that two weeks, is spent adjusting before going back to domesticity. This is even more relevant when leaving the structure of life and the forces for good. Yes, you are coming out with skills. You have been part of a team. You may have been a team leader. These may be immediately transferable to civil life, IT skills, trades, and so on, but some may need retraining. Add to that simply having to organize basic aspects of everyday life, which the armed forces have done for you over the years, a GP, a home. Then if you're in a relationship, as I've referenced, you have to rebalance responsibilities with your partner. You're coming home every day. You may be working from home. This must put pressures on relationships. You have to get acclimatized to general, everyday, civil life. You must organize yourself when, as I've said previously, days and years were organized for you, and you are separated from close-knit colleagues. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are estimated to be over 200,000 veterans in Scotland, with it's understood a higher percentage living in rural areas, historically where families over generations joined various long-gone regiments, such as in the borders, the King's Own Scottish borders. Now, over the decades, the MOD has come a long way in recognising and acting on its duties, not just as an employer, but with a fiduciary duty extending beyond in my book, those service years. And this parliament too has stepped in, aware that veterans are assets to our society, but do many require support, and that there's a small proportion who find the transition to civilian life more challenging and are due the right support to ensure that they too are able to adapt, realize their potential, and live full and successful lives after service in the community. But a small proportion find the transition too tough. I understand there were around 243 prisoners in Scottish jails in July this year who'd served in the armed forces, according to Scottish prison service figures. But similar figures have never been collated 
for those given sentences such as community payback order, supervision or tagging. People with non-custodial sentences do not get support which should and is often offered to those in prison. These uh, veterans fall between metaphorical cracks. So I would ask um, through the Minister if he would ask the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to pursue the recording of this information on those veterans who receive a criminal sentence but not a custodial sentence, not just for its own sake, though that's useful, but to provide support there too. The Armed Forces Charity SAFA has caseworkers to work with people serving community sentences, and Police Scotland have veterans champions at divisional level, but they need to know who they are and where they are. Finally, Lothian's Veterans Centre in Dalkeith is a small independent charity which supports military veterans and their families. It offers a safe, relaxed and supportive environment where like-minded people can share experiences, gain professional and peer support in a home-from-home -home setting, breaking down barriers of social exclusion and promoting comradeship. It is a drop-in centre in the centre of Dalkeith, which I visited, with a welcoming environment which can provide instant assistance, support and advice in relation to a wide range of services, including health and wellbeing, housing, employment, benefits, pensions, further education and training and access to health services, but also welfare, comradeship and activities. Veterans can also just drop in for a cup of tea and a chat. Most of their professional team have served in the armed forces or are connected with the armed forces in some way. So they possess a wealth of experience and it also means they offer an empathetic approach to supporting veterans and their family members, making their transition from military to civilian life easier. I commend them and we direct veterans to their website and that of SAFA. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. I now call Megan Gallagher to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Ms. Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by apologising to the Chair and to the Chamber, as I will need to leave shortly after my contribution this afternoon. Edward Mountain was spot on as usual. It is right that we highlight the challenges our veterans face, the report by the Veterans Commissioner, and the work that is ongoing to better support our veterans. But as a parliament, we don't really focus on the contributions that our servicemen and women bring to our country. And it doesn't stop when they leave the forces. And there, that's where I would like to start my contributions today. Because I know a wonderful group of ex-servicemen and women in Lanarkshire, B Clan. Veterans Community Lanarkshire is a charity that supports veterans and their families in the Lanarkshire area. They are based in Craig Newk, but also hold a drop-in cafe every Friday in the King's Church in Motherwell, and I must say, the soup is delicious. I have had the pleasure of their company on many an occasion, and they are one of the many reasons that I am proud to live in Lanarkshire. Like many veterans, they want this government to focus on issues that matter to them and their community. Our veterans fought for our rights and freedoms, and I believe that giving them the right support and tools is the least that we can do when they retire from service. B Clan are the custodians of war memorials in Lanarkshire. They care for, clean and tidy these important landmarks. And I know of many other groups across Scotland who also take on this important role. The Chamber might be aware of the stark increase in the number of war memorials that have been desecrated in recent years. War memorials were commissioned throughout towns and villages in Scotland to commemorate the brave men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice so we could live in a world free of tyranny and oppression. For many of the families and relatives, these memorials provide the only focal point for remembering. It is the names of their loved ones who have been etched into the hundreds of war memorials across the country. They are emotive and at the very heart of communities. It is important that we continue to meet at these important landmarks and that younger generations are educated on what the names on the structures fought and died for. Presiding officer, since 1996, there have been 66 attacks on war memorials in Scotland. And although that number appears low, almost 70% have occurred since 2014. This is a worrying trend. 
Data shows that most attacks have taken place across the central belt, particularly in the area I represent. During my time as a councillor and now MSP, I have been made aware of several incidents of war memorials being damaged and vandalised. The first incident was the war memorial situated in the Duchess Park in Motherwell in 2019. I was horrified by the wording of the graffiti that had been drawn all over the names of soldiers who fought and died for our country. Words such as fascists, rats, alongside the phrase scum of the earth. This is what was written in red wax that had been stained into the stone. And although some community members and veterans had attempted to clean it off, it required a specialised stone mason to carry out the repair work. Following this attack, I have been involved in other incidents, such as the Memorial in Quote Bridge, Lark Hall War Memorial Grounds, the Spanish Civil War Memorial in Motherwell, and the Holotown War Memorial. It shouldn't be left to veterans and specialised stonemasons to carry out these repairs, because it shouldn't be happening in the first place. Due to the levels of attacks on war memorials across Scotland, groups such as the Friends uh, Sorry, groups such as the Friends of Deniston War Memorial have been at the forefront of a campaign to bring in better protections. They have organised a successful social media campaign to highlight the number of incidents and have brought together groups of people who care about our heritage, our history and our war dead. They have petitioned this Parliament on numerous occasions asking that more is done to protect these sites from the mindless and abhorrent tax on these memories of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. But sadly, this didn't go any further. So that's why I have launched a consultation on a proposed Members' Bill entitled Desecration of War Memorials Prevention Scotland Bill. This is a bill asked for by veterans to support veterans and their families, the Armed Forces community and anyone who has a loved one's name placed on a war memorial. Because as it stands, when war, when war memorials are desecrated, the law treats this as vandalism. This fails to both recognise the distress caused to communities and the significance of these landmarks. It treats desecrating a war memorial the same way as it would a lamppost or a telephone box. My bill would create the offence of a desecration of a war memorial and increase the range of sanctions available for prosecuting damage caused to a war memorial. And I am hoping that this bill would create a stronger deterrent and ensure that war memorials are given the protection that they deserve. As I have said, this bill is for our armed forces and veterans community, for those who have lost a loved one during conflict, or for those who are related or know someone whose name is etched into the stone. The consultation will run until the 19th of December, and I do urge everyone to fill it in. And I'm also asking if the Minister will consider my proposals of this important bill and consider giving it his backing. This would show that the Parliament is truly on the side of veterans and on the side of fallen soldiers for whom we owe so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. I now call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Claire Baker. Ms Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am very pleased to speak in this debate this afternoon and at the, out, at the outset I pay tribute to all our military personnel who have committed to making the ultimate sacrifice to defend our freedom, to our Veterans Commissioner and all the organisations supporting our armed forces and veteran community, and I pay particular tribute to support our paras. So today I want to focus on two areas, education and employment. Earlier this summer, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Jerry Matthew Smith from the Centre for Military Research and Military Engagement at Edinburgh Napier University to discuss the findings in her report, You're On Your Own Now, Understanding Current Experiences of Transition to Civilian Life in Scotland. And among the issues explored in the report is access to education. Uh, the report uh, notes that despite the advantages that result from academic qualifications, veterans don't often pursue such a pathway. So I'm pleased an articulation uh, mechanism has been developed with the University of Strathclyde to allow those with an HND qualification to enter initial teacher education. And I'm also pleased that the Scottish Government continues to develop the Service Children's Progression Alliance to support service children access higher and further education too. 
Separately, however, I am aware that access to education for spouses and partners is challenging where service personnel have enlisted in England but are now based in Scotland. And in these circumstances, a partner wishing to study in Scotland is not entitled to have their fees paid. Now, bearing in mind families play a vital role in facilitating successful tra transitions, and while I do understand the circumstances of this restriction, I would be interested in any update that the Minister may be able to provide on options to look at this issue further. Uh, turning to the uh, veterans in the energy sector, uh, many energy companies are increasingly recognising the benefits of recruiting men and women from the armed forces and they can offer a range of employment opportunities. Qualities such as team leadership, organisational skills and technological knowledge are all highly prized by the sector and career opportunities exist in the fields of engineering, project management, health and safety and the skilled trades. So to meet its future commitments, the sector is already working to match industry job profiles with military roles, identifying transferable positions and importantly training and conversion opportunities. I'm pleased that Yes, happy to. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the member for, for uh, taking the intervention. Can I, on that note, uh, would you join me in welcoming the repair work that the, res the reservists uh, from the 7th Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, carried out on the Gordon Highlanders uh, Museum's World, World War One trench this July, because I think that actually the good work that they've done uh, is very supportive of, of what the museum is trying to, to keep going in, in regards to their education. Audrey Nicholl. I, I thank my friend and colleague Jackie Dunbar for um, her intervention and of course the Gordon Highlanders Museum is in my constituency uh, and I, I know the value of the work that they do not just in terms of supporting uh, vocational work and work that is practical but also in it offering a space uh, for veterans and others to uh, come together. It's a highly valued uh, resource uh, in the northeast of Scotland. So I'm pleased that Offshore Energies UK has signed up to the Armed Forces Covenant and received the Employer Recognition Scheme Bronze Award. And similarly, Port of Aberdeen has also signed up to the Armed Forces Covenant. And these are only two of many examples of the way that the sector values veterans and service leavers. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to note the Veterans uh, Commissioner uh, progress update on aligning military and civilian skills and qualifications. And I know this isn't necessarily always a straightforward process, and I'm also pleased to note the military skills and qualifications discovery tool. I look forward to reading the Commissioner's uh, annual report that has just been published, but having had a quick look at it today, I do note uh, the update on the work of Skills Development Scotland uh, and how that's continuing uh, to develop with a career transition partnership to refer new employers to them, and also the close uh, relationship between Skills Development Scotland and veteran organisations. I was very pleased to note the new RecruitVeterans.Scot website has been launched and it contains some extremely helpful information for businesses about the benefits veterans can bring to the workforce and I would urge all members to highlight this website in their constituencies and regions. Of course, the Scottish Government Veterans Strategy Action Plan and the Veterans Fund continues to underpin much of the work being progressed in Scotland, and I know the Minister is utterly committed to this work, particularly as he, uh, as he flagged, we are still all grappling with the cost of living crisis and the lag of COVID. So I want to conclude um, my contribution today with just a couple of quotes from uh, some young serving personnel who I engaged with in preparation for today. And they told me, and I quote, 
The Army is very accommodating to welfare issues. However, it varies from unit to unit. Some regiments have well-oiled welfare support in place through charities like Combat Stress and Support Our Paras. They are absolutely vital for welfare help. But to be honest, simply chatting to each other and having each other there for support is the most important. And I know we will lend our weight to that support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by Ivan McKee. Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and to recognise the importance of our veterans and armed forces community. The Government motion is right to highlight the valuable contribution that they make to our communities and society. And we all want to see our veterans and armed forces communities supported in the best way possible to secure the best outcomes for them and their families. The publication of the annual update on Scottish Government support for the community ahead of this debate is welcome. It highlights some areas where progress has been made and the vital role of those working to deliver quality support across the public, private and third sectors. Historically, Fife has had a long and proud tradition with the military, with the Royal Naval Base in Rosyth, and first the RAF and more recently the Army Base at Lukerts. Close to 20,000 veterans are estimated to live in Fife with their families. And we have a number of organisations involved in providing support and advice to that community, including the Fife Community Covenant Partnership, the Armed Services Advice Project, SSAFA Fife and Veterans First Point. Um, I want to raise a matter which I know the Minister is aware of around blue badge entitlement and specifically the differences in eligibility criteria for a blue badge between Scotland and England and how it relates to PTSD. I appreciate there has been correspondence directly with my constituent about this, outlining the approach that is taken across Scotland. But I would suggest that consideration should be given to looking at the scheme, at how the scheme could be improved for veterans, and to take better account of their particular circumstances. It does seem unfair to me that veterans are disadvantaged in Scotland compared to England, and their needs aren't always being met through the scheme because a higher threshold is being set in Scotland. Um, President Officer, I will now focus on some of the work that has gone on in Fife, particularly looking at some of the challenges around social isolation and mental well-being, which are too sadly relevant for our veterans community. The report from the Scottish Veterans Commissioner has highlighted mental health as one of the areas we need to see further progress in. I do hear the Minister's concern that we recognise the huge contribution uh, veterans make every day to their communities, and I do pay tribute to the community. But our responsibility here is also to look at where we can improve people's lives and improve their opportunities. And the publication earlier this year of Recovering Our Connections is an important step in the work to address social isolation and loneliness. And its commitment to engage with veterans organisations is welcome. We must take steps to better identify how to support the armed forces community and strengthen social connections, including by building on successful work that's already taking place. So across my region, we have a number of breakfast clubs which can play an important part in daily life. They provide social contact and camaraderie, as well as a place to talk about accessing relevant services. In recent years, we've seen the development of the Rosewell Centre in Lahore as a dedicated mental health and wellbeing centre for veterans. It provides psychosocial support programme delivered by veteran peer support workers, which aims to address key aspects of veteran wellbeing, such as employment, financial stability and social connection. Organisations like the Veterans Foundation are supporting charities across the UK on a range of projects. And Fife Employment Access Trust used funding from the Veterans Foundation to deliver the Grow Your Kind programme, an outdoor-based personal development and employability course for former armed forces personnel with mental health conditions. The six-month programme provides veterans with experience of horticulture and conservation, alongside teaching techniques for them to manage their mental health, and is just one of the many funded grants from the Foundation. Uh, families of those leaving the armed forces also go through huge adjustments in their lives. I've previously met with uh, Ruby Boots, run by Forces Children Scotland, which helps young people prepare for their parents leaving the armed forces. As part of their work, they provide a peer buddy system where a young person who's already made the change to civilian life mentors other young people and supports them through the process. Ruby Boots was set up after young people told Forces Children Scotland that specific help wasn't there for them when parents decided to leave the forces. And I welcome that they're now able to provide that support. 
So the work of organisations like these in my region and across Scotland is so important to improving the lives of our veterans and armed forces community and their families. And we all recognise the hard work and commitment that goes into delivering it across so many third sector organisations, as well as those in the public and private sector. The new data on veterans gathered in the census is one of the more positive outcomes of the recent census process. And I hope this can be used to effectively inform other work. Data collection is an important part of ensuring policy is not only directing the right places, but in allowing us to assess the effectiveness of any interventions. There does need to be improvements made around the collection of figures on veterans and armed forces community in terms of the impact of alcohol and drug use, so we can better ensure support is getting to those who need it. While figures show that around 3% of those who engage in drug and alcohol treatment services are veterans, it is vital that we are delivering outreach work to target those who are not in treatment but might be in need of help. Recent publications related to drug deaths have not included specific information on veterans and this may be an area that is worth required, um, requiring greater focus. And looking at the criminal justice system, while those serving custodial, sorry. <coughs> sorry, excited officer. In those looking at in looking at the criminal justice system, while those serving custodial sentences are asked whether they are ex-service personnel, well, I've not spent time with really any, I'm thinking maybe I've got, but uh, there are ex-service personnel and offered support from SACRO and SSAFA, similar information is not collected for those receiving community payback orders, supervision or tagging. And they do not get the same support offered to those in prison. As Christine Graham's already highlighted in the debate, there are um, gaps in the data that we need to address to ensure we better serve the needs of veterans across our society. And I very much support the calls for improvements in this area. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. Speaker, and well done for getting to the end. Uh, I guess probably most people in the Chamber hope you have not been spending too much time with Mr. Rennie, the circumstances, particularly those sitting right beside you. Um, I now call uh, Ivan McKee to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Mr. McKee. An officer, and um, it's a, a pleasure to speak in this um, debate this afternoon on Scotland's veterans and armed forces community. Um, and uh, let the minister know I have had a, a read through the annual uh, update, and it um, contains some very uh, important and uh, useful information. And I'd just like to start by echoing the comments that the minister made, and others, Edward Mountain and Willie Rennie made. Um, about the, the, the veterans community in Scotland uh, and the fact that in the vast majority of cases veterans uh, manage that transition and are very um, constructive and valuable members of uh, society in, in all walks of life. But of course it is important, as has been pointed out by, by the Minister and others, that we uh, recognise the fact that notwithstanding that there are challenges in certain areas and we should do all we can uh, as a parliament to, uh, to support that, uh, that transition for many, many reasons, um, because it's important for, for veterans and their families, but also because it's important for our society and our broader economy, as I'll come on to, to talk about. The areas I wanted to focus on in my remarks this afternoon are uh, uh, around about veterans' experience on uh, accessing housing and other support services, interactions with the, 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 the justice service, employment opportunities, but, but also, very importantly, uh, the contribution that veterans can make to, to Scotland society and economy. Economy. Um, it, the Scottish uh, Veterans Commissioner called for improvements in housing support, uh, identifying that over half of service uh, leavers uh, leave service without uh, housing uh, arrangements uh, in place to the level that they need to be. So I welcome the Scottish Government's focus on this area um, with the, the Veterans Scotland uh, Housing Group um, and the work that it's taking, uh, taking forward, but also like to highlight uh, the work of uh, Scottish Veterans Residences. Um, which is Scotland's oldest ex-services charity dating to 1910. Um, they uh, operate three premises across, uh, across Scotland. Um, the, 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 the Whiteford uh, premise across uh, uh, the Royal Mile from the Parliament members will be aware of uh, premises in Dundee and um, the uh, Bell Rock Close premises in my own constituency in Glasgow Proven and I'm delighted to wear, have an opportunity today to wear the SVR tie uh, on, on the occasion of this, uh, this debate in, uh, in the Parliament. Um, the, the, the residents provide not just uh, housing support but also counselling.
counselling, benefits claims and, and war pensions, uh, support, um, support with education, training and access to volunteer work and uh, opportunities and activities, uh, sports and hobbies for, uh, for veterans. I have had the pleasure of visiting on several occasions the, the Bell Rock Close premises in my own constituency, which was purpose built. Um, for, uh, for, for veterans. It contains 30 fully furnished one-bed flats that veterans can stay in for up to 18 months, where their transition is supported with wraparound support um, uh, across a whole range of services, um, uh, including education, training, employability, uh, future housing needs, health and wellbeing, including access to therapeutic counselling, and a very well-used and, uh, and well-kitted well, well out gym, plus an IT suite cafe, uh, and a whole range of, uh, of other curricular, uh, extracurricular activities that veterans can engage in um, in a very effective setting and the residence also contains 21 um, self-contained uh, flats which uh, residents can move into and stay there permanently at affordable rent so I, I really recommend and commend the work that they, uh, they do. Um, the second area I wanted to cover was the uh, interaction of veterans with uh, the justice um, system, um, not least because Berlini Prison uh, also resides in my, uh, my province constituency. Um, now, as has been identified in the report and by the Minister and others, there are uh, significant gaps in data, um, and I welcome their further work uh, that has been undertaken by the Government with ONS um, uh, through the Census and other routes to, uh, to flesh out that data, so the understanding of vet, 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 uh, veterans' experiences and circumstances um, is, is much better understood. But the data that I have managed to find indicates that there are around 220,000 um, ex-US Armed Forces personnel residing in Scotland, which is, uh, I think, slightly less than 5 per cent of the adult population, um, and data, recent data from the Scottish Prison Services Survey from 2019 indicates that around 11 per cent of, um, of prisoners um, are, uh, uh, have an armed forces background, so clearly disproportionately represented within that, uh, that cohort, um, which indicates the need for uh, further work to be, uh, to be done to, uh, to address those, uh, those challenges, understand the reasons for that disproportionate representation and provide support services to, uh, to mitigate that where possible. I therefore welcome that Police Scotland um, is pledges under the Armed Forces Covenant to support the, the veterans community and introduce veterans champions in the custody and criminal justice environment to help address some of these, uh, these issues. Um, the next thing I wanted to touch on was um, the very welcome um, uh, narrative within the report and from the Minister in viewing veterans as assets to our community and our economy, particularly in an environment where labour and skill shortages are the biggest single challenge facing businesses. businesses. So it was great to see the campaign launched with uh, businesses to help employers understand the benefits uh, the veterans can bring to the workforce. Their skills, experience, clearly uh, often in, in very challenging circumstances can equip them very well to deal with, uh, with, with, with working for, uh, for business. Indeed, I will. Yeah. Uh, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Thanks to, to Ivan McKee. I wonder if you would agree with me, and I, I totally agree with the points he's making, that there is a challenge here for employers to evangelise far more about why they recruit from the veterans um, cohort, because they don't do it out of altruism, as, as the member has alluded to. They do it because they get a fantastic, reliable workforce. I, I, I completely agree with the Minister in that regard, and I think that's may um, benefit from a conversation we, we can have later about how I can use my ongoing interaction with the, the business community in many, many sectors to raise this, uh, this uh, topic and the opportunity that, as he rightly identifies, veterans can bring to uh, businesses across a whole range of uh, sectors with the skills and experiences they, uh, they possess. I uh, welcome the work that's ongoing with SDS um, and, uh, and other work to um, uh, uh, provide the support for, uh, for veterans in terms of accessing skills. And the final point I wanted to make was round about the, the government's ambition, very welcome ambition, for Scotland to be viewed as a destination of choice for service leavers and their families. Um, I think this is um, hugely important, not just for the aspiration it sets for us to, to raise the bar in terms of the, the support um, and the landing uh, zones that are, that are available for, uh, for excess service personnel and their families within Scotland, but also the opportunity it gives for Scotland to attract talent from the rest of the UK and who have that armed forces background if they recognise that Scotland is a great place for them to base themselves, their families and start their careers after they leave service. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer.
Thank you, Ms. McKee. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Alec Rowley, and Ms. Chapman is joining us remotely. Ms. Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and before I forgin, Presiding Officer, I hope Edward Mountain will apologise for stating that Scottish Greens were not contributing to today's debate. In the age of hybrid working, just because Scottish Greens, or indeed Liberal Democrats, are not in the chamber, that does not mean we are not contributing, as Willie's, Willie, Willie Rennie's earlier contribution and my speaking now indicates. Like Christine Graham, I am a pacifist, but that does not mean that I do not care about how we treat our veterans and what support we provide them and their families. So I welcome the opportunity to reflect on and discuss the Scottish Government's annual update to Parliament. And I welcome the opportunity to recognise the positive contributions that veterans make to many of our communities. And of course, it is important that we continue to strive to do more to support veterans. The Minister highlighted some of the areas where good progress is being made, but there is always more we can do and must do, as we've already heard from others. I want to particularly thank the Minister for his comments today and previously about Lord Etherton's LGBT Veterans Independent Review. This important report published this year examines the service, the service and experience of LGBTQI veterans who served in the UK Armed Forces between 1967 and 2000. It describes the terrible consequences for individuals and families of that period's shameful official policy of homophobia and transphobia. I add my personal solidarity and sorrow. Join the review's calls for recognition, apology and restitution and look forward to discussing with the Minister its recommendations to the Scottish Government. The Minister has also spoken about the opportunities he has had in his role to remember and memorialise those who have been sent to war. For remembering matters, we are after all approaching that time of year when things that are very different often have a habit of being elided, conflated and conveniently confused. It centres, of course, on Remembrance Day when we pause to remember those who died in conflict, perhaps especially in the brutal horrors of the First World War. But as the last of that war's veterans have passed away, their testimony silent, something new began to emerge. The core of the Remembrance message never again was plastered over with new and shiny messages of the thrill of battle, the success of the so-called defence industry, the trailing remnants of British imperial power. We owe it, I think, both to those who died in war and those who still live with its legacy, veterans and civilians, to remember accurately and well. Care for veterans and their families is much too important to be tied up with unquestioning support for all that the armed forces do or are called to do, or for the deadly industry whose products they deploy. Just as solidarity with the people of Ukraine and resistance to the Putin regime must not be a cover for the normalization of war and impunity for the arms trade. Putin's power was enabled by many forces and factors, including national leaders mesmerized by his macho image and greedy for his oligarchs' billions. Last minute swerves to hostility are about as convincing as their other stories. Meanwhile, the invasion leaves thousands more wounded veterans in Europe Thousands more bereaved families, lost lives, homeless refugees. It leads devastating environmental loss throughout the region and food shortages far beyond. The victims of war are never only those in uniform. The deadly tentacles of this war are spreading far in both place and time to blight the lives of future as well as, president, as present generations. As today's motion and review reflect, we owe respect and care for veterans after they have served in our armed forces. But we also owe it to them and to present and potential forces members to pay proper attention to the causes of the violent conflicts they may be called up upon to join. In an era when UK personnel take part in UN peacekeeping missions, often in some of the poorest and most environmentally vulnerable parts of the world, global decisions more and more impact the lives of Scottish veterans. We know some of those causes very well. Political power games, arms trade profiteering, and struggles for resources. Those resources, of course, include fossil fuels and minerals, so often a curse for those who live right alongside them. But increasingly, conflicts are arising over access to fresh water and to fertile land. 
Those shortages, those struggles, and their tragic consequences are all, of course, heightened, deepened, and broadened by growing climate change and inequality. Last month saw a crucial UN summit on the Sustainable Development Goals, representing the halfway point before their aspirational achievement date of 2030. Those goals, as we know, are absolutely fundamental core obligations shared internationally. They are recognized as essential to any hope of a livable, just and peaceful world for the children of today. And because they are so vital, many government delegations to that summit were headed by their leaders, but not all. For some governments had other work they had decided to do, the work of dismantling their plans for decarbonisation, the work of approving new fossil fuel extraction, the work of sacrificing essential climate action and of demonising refugees. Those actions and inactions shamelessly light the fuel of future conflicts throughout the globe, causing future veterans. Conflicts in which many will be killed and wounded, many wearing military uniform, but many too in school uniform, many in baby clothes. If we want, as this motion reminds us, to pay honest respect to veterans now and in the weeks to come, we must listen to what they tell us about their needs here and now. Their needs for employment support, healthcare, children's education, support in prisons and beyond, as highlighted by Christine Graham. Indeed, all the important issues covered by today's review. I thank Willie Rennie especially for his contribution and wish him a speedy recovery. But, presiding officer, we must also listen to the distant voices of those who wore the very first remembrance poppies, veterans, families and strangers alike. We owe it to them, too, at the, at the same time as supporting current veterans and their families to work to build and make a more peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Pam Gossel. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to be speaking in this debate today. I have spoken in a few such debates over the years, and an issue that came up again and again was the lack of available data around veterans that would provide the information to ensure an evidence-based approach to policy making in this area. So I'm pleased that good progress has been made, and as the Minister has said, we are now on the cusp of having a lot of really rich and useful information which we can use to better develop policy and understand how and where we can improve services to support for veterans and their families. So I think that is really positive progress. This is good progress that I do hope leads to better informed policy and ultimately clearer and better outcomes for veterans and their families. I would also welcome the collaboration and coordination between the UK and devolved governments and indeed the many organisations that work daily to support and improve services for veterans and their families. There are excellent examples in our communities of organisations supporting veterans and as such we must continue to support those groups across Scotland to ensure that no veteran is left behind. I would also want to highlight the work of Veterans and Armed Forces champions and local authorities. When I was a councillor in Fife, I saw firsthand the role that these champions played in ensuring joined up approaches within the councils and indeed being a strong voice within the authority, raising the issues coming direct from local veterans groups and from individuals. The councillor that had the role back then in Fife, Charles Haffey, was himself a veteran and was passionate about the job. Since then, I'm aware that others have been doing a great job as well and have been in touch with me in my role when they have needed support. So I'm pleased that the government continues to recognise the importance of this role and continues to work with local authorities to enhance and develop the role. I would, however, want to be candid when it comes to local government services, and we should acknowledge that there are not enough houses for people to live in, and council housing lists continue to grow at the rate they do, then veterans like hundreds of thousands on waiting lists will find it difficult to get housing if the housing doesn't exist. The same can be said for many local services. In the same vein, if people 
are in their homes going cold but not able to afford to switch the heating on, then they will suffer the same plight whether they are veterans or not. So to be clear, veterans, particularly older veterans, are facing a really difficult time, as is the millions of their fellow citizens up and down the UK this winter. And the main point I want to make is if our economy is tanking, if energy costs are out of control, and if incomes cannot keep up with costs, then veterans will suffer and pay the price like everyone else who are on low incomes. I do welcome the work of those veteran organisations that are focused on doing their best to support people and maximise the assistance they can access, but the best support would be to build a fairer and more just economy that works in the interests of the many. But for those transitioning from the armed forces, we must first say to them, to veterans, that they are an asset to both Scotland, Scotland's workplaces and communities. And we must ensure that we harness their potential and fully support them to transition smoothly into civilian life. So the actions being taken on employment, education and skills are also very welcome. But I do say to the Minister, who is also has the brief for higher and further education, if our colleges are struggling, cancelling courses and paying off tutors, then that will also impact on those transitioning to civilian, to the civil street. Just as it will impact on anyone wanting to improve their life chances and their opportunities. So we do need to address some of the urgent issues that are there just now particularly in further education. Again, the point I'm making is veterans will not be immune from the wider policy issues that are of grave concern at this time, and our colleges being one of them, the lucky housing being another. The same applies to our NHS. Those who have sacrificed the most for our country deserve the best care possible. While there has been priority given to the health care of veterans, we cannot become complacent about the quality of these services, and in particular mental health services, where there is a massive pressure on those services at this time. So in conclusion, presiding officer, if this, report, if this was a report card, I believe it would state that what we're seeing is very good progress being made, but more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Pam Gossel to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am honoured to contribute to today's important debate in support of the Veterans and Armed Forces community along with my colleagues, and I will be supporting today's Government motion. I consider myself lucky to have met a number of veterans who have served our country, as well as the dedicated third sector organisations who support them day in and day out. As an Indian woman, I was really honoured to be invited to the ceremonial bricklaying for Scotland's first British Indian Army Memorial, which will mark the contribution for over four million South Asian soldiers who fought in both world wars. And I would like to congratulate the organisation behind the memorial, Colourful Heritage. For years, Colourful Heritage has been committed to achieving recognition for these soldiers as well as educating people on the role of the British Indian Army. Let me today in this chamber pay tribute to the British Indian Army, including Naik Gyan Singh, a member of the 15th Punjab Regiment of the British Indian Army, who was awarded the Victoria Cross for his bravery in the face of the enemy in Burma in 1945 and the many others like him as well as a band of war heroes who served with the Indian Army and perished in the Scottish Highlands who were buried at the cemetery in Kinghusie. The Scottish Government has been very supportive of this project by Colourful Heritage, but I would welcome more information on how the Scottish Government will be helping to support this initiative and others like it moving forward. In my region, charities, including the Homeless Veterans Project 
and many more have stepped in to provide support for our armed forces community as they transition to civilian life. However, we know that funding and resources are scarce, making it challenging for them to deliver these services. This drive is to help the veterans community must be matched within the government, and I really hope the Scottish Government will deliver on their responsibilities in this area. This includes areas such as housing. I recently submitted a written question on what assessment the Scottish Government has undertaken of the impact of the reported housing shortage and housing policies that are aimed at military service leavers and veterans. But the Minister was unable to provide a detailed answer, so I hope when the Minister is summing up that he will provide some kind of um, clarity and detail around that. We must remember that 821 veterans were forced to apply for homeless applications in Scotland last year, and over 100 veterans had to sleep rough. That is why the Scottish Conservatives want to introduce a distinct Veterans Help to Buy scheme, which would give them more support when buying a home in Scotland. And that, uh, and that this is something that I hope the Scottish Government will support. But I am pleased to note that some progress has been made in other areas, particularly with the development of the General Practice Armed Forces and Veterans Recognition Scheme. In our recent response to me, the Minister outlined that a full national rollout of this scheme will go ahead towards the end of the year. Ahead of this rollout, I hope to see further details on how the Government will promote the scheme to GPs and service users ahead of the full launch. While I am hoping that this scheme will be helpful for signposting sources to, of support, we do need to see a more joined-up approach across devolved public bodies, including the NHS and the local government, to enhance the support available to veterans to transition into civilian life. Because progress on mental health service provisions and skills and learning are currently not progressing fast enough, this is why we proposed an Armed Forces and Veterans Bill to create a new focus on supporting veteran, veterans to get access to education, a new home, a new career, health care, financial assistance and much more. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I am honoured to have contributed to this important debate on supporting our veterans armed forces community. As has been made clear throughout today's debate, the contribution that our servicemen and women bring to the country does not stop when, stop when they leave the armed forces, but continues and grows as they transition back into our communities. Our veterans and armed forces community are an asset to our society. For our tomorrow, they gave their today. And we must do everything in our power to ensure that they have access to the support they need. Thank you. And I call on Keith Brown, the final speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I start by just agreeing with the first part of Pam Gozo's speech when she mentioned colourful heritage and the contribution very often not acknowledged of the uh, Indian uh, Army, the British Indian Army at the time, especially the Second World War. I visited each one of the graves at King Yusei, plus there's two others at Donock, I think, and also the makeshift mosque in Laird, where over 300 soldiers were accommodated uh, in that tiny little village in the Highlands uh, during the Second World War. Um, I'm delighted to take part in the debate. I've done one or two of these debates in the past, and I've not really had the opportunity, because of the role that I had at the time, to say some more, as many members have done in the past, about the personal history. I mention this because at the last veterans debate that I spoke in as minister, um, it was actually one where you cannot easily get a, a deputy or somebody to, to stand in your, in your place for that debate, and I could not therefore go to my uncle's funeral, my uncle Robert Imbrora. And it struck me at the time that he had served nine years in the Royal Navy, had served many years after that in the British listening stations up the north east coast um, in Scotland, but also that each of his brothers and his sister had also served in the armed forces, usually in the Navy, or in two brothers' case, uh, during the NH, uh, during um, the active uh, sorry, national service uh, in the army. And also um, their father, my grandfather, who uh, is on a war memorial in Pitlochry, he served with the Black Watch in the First World War. Um, and also I thought, well, the same is true for my uh, mother's side of the family as well. She 
had a number of brothers, one of whom uh, retired as a major from the army. He was then murdered in Pennycook when he was uh, overseeing the transition of wages to pay the soldiers uh, after he had retired, but he was helping out in that regard. And two other brothers who went to Queen Victoria School in Dumblain, my constituency, which was at that time, as it is now, for the offspring of members of the armed forces. And it's just to point out that, of course, members of the armed forces and veterans are of us. They are part of the families and the wider society that we all inhabit. Just a couple of other very quick points. First of all, I'm, I'm glad the Minister mentioned the medal replacement scheme. I think it's useful if he can get as much publicity for that as possible. The, government, the Scottish Government can't replace medals, of course, but what it can do is when the MOD does agree to replace a medal, it can stand for the cost of replacing that medal if it's required to do so, and I, th I know that's been very uh, welcome. Also, in relation to uh, the physical and mental uh, needs of veterans, that's been mentioned. Could I just mention uh, Rock to Recovery, a small charity, and although many people, Alec Riley and others, have called on additional support from the NHS, I would not want to see undervalued the support that's provided by people who themselves are veterans to other veterans. Rock to Recovery is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, service and is very valuable for that reason. And I would encourage the Scottish Government to continue to engage with Rock to Recovery to see how they can help in relation to uh, veterans needing that service. And also in my own area to uh, We County Veterans who do a fantastic job for veterans in Clipmanager. In relation to housing, which was mentioned by uh, Edward Mountain, in fact, Edward Mountain mentioned when he left the forces and he got, I think he said, £500 and a resettlement course, and things have got much better since then. Well, I can tell him that I got neither £500 nor a resettlement course nor a pension when I left the armed forces. So things have improved a, a little bit in the meantime. Um, also, I would say that uh, in relation to Willie Rennie's points, and I disagree with his, his point about how he would try to address the issue of education, much of what the Scottish Government has to do has to respond to what the MOD does. And he made a point about the fact that people can be shifted between different uh, billets. And more recently, five or six years ago, there was a situation in Scotland of a family who'd been moved from Germany to Edinburgh to Belfast. Three different postings with their family in the space of 18 months. And it's the public authorities that are going to try and address that kind of uh, challenge. And I think we do it very well in Scotland. In fact, I think there's a great deal that has been done in Scotland which is worthy of some more comment, the Scottish Veterans Fund, we've heard it mentioned, the census, the de development there. The dedicated Minister for Veterans, which I think started under the, the former First Minister in 2008, um, and it reached a golden period where you had a minister in the Cabinet. And I think the minister should use that as his uh, gambit uh, to try and get into the Cabinet to say <laughs> we should have a, a, a ministerial level appointment in the Cabinet. But it does show the attention that's been paid to that, and I think that's a real success. And I've also been aware of the way things have changed. I remember saying in 2011-12 that what we had to do was try and address disadvantage rather than provide advantage. It was actually quite a contentious thing to say at that time. Uh, but now it seems to be the language that everyone's using and it's uh, no, none the worse uh, for that. So I think Scotland does do a great deal which is uh, worthy of commendation. Of course, there will always be more to do. I should say in relation to uh, Christine Graham and Maggie Chapman, I am not a pacifist. Um, I do think it's essential that we do have armed forces and that they're well trained and well looked after. And also I would say that in relation to this debate, and too many like it, um, people veer away by and large from any contention, any kind of political back and forth. And I think that patronises rather than promotes the interests of veterans. They're not people that have to be mollycoddled. They can understand political differences. And I don't think we should shy away from that. And I think in relation to some of the differences, I would say that um, Edward uh, Mountain mentioned he thought the bu budget for the Veterans Fund was too small and we should take it away from overseas trips. I don't know whether that would include the trip I made, the two trips I made to the Falklands uh, on, the government's, uh, on the government's ticket. I would say, if we are going to be contentious, why not not have illegal wars and pay instead the money required for proper boots, proper helicopter support, proper tanks for our, our forces? I think also you could avoid things like handing out P-45s uh, to service personnel on active service in Afghanistan. I mean, think about what's really important to veterans uh, in these circumstances. And also in relation to Megan Gallagher, I don't support uh, her proposal. Uh, I don't think we should marginalise uh, the, what I think is an abominable thing to do to face a war memorial. Uh, I think we should take it away from the general uh, remit uh, of the law. And the last thing I'll say, on a, motion, on a note of consensus, is that the point that Edward Mountain made about housing is really important. And I think he identified, which I've done in the past, where the MOD has estates in Scotland, 
with which they're no longer using Craigie Hall. It's got hundreds of houses literally uh, on it. But there's other sites as well. If the Parliament could come together to say to get a spearhead, and Edward Mountain will know the significance of that word, spearhead, uh, if we could get spearhead a campaign to get the MOD to convert that into veterans or housing available for veterans, it may require selling some off and bringing others up to standard. But it's perfectly possible we can make a big difference to the housing situation for veterans if the Parliament was able to come together and do that. But uh, in conclusion, I would say I'm very grateful that the Parliament has once again recorded its support and the admiration both for veterans because of the service they've had and the contribution they continue to make to society. Thank you. And we move on to winding up speeches. And I call on Sarah Boyer. Thank you, presiding officer. Just uh, how tight is the speaker's time today? Um, is it a generous six minutes? It is a very generous six minutes. Excellent. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, can I first of all register, um, refer members to my register of interest, my former work with SFHA. Um, I do think to, today's debate has been an important debate, but a respectful one. And I think the, the points that Keith Brown made about um, being over consensual. I think actually there was quite a few issues where members didn't agree entirely um, and I think part of the nature of consensus is actually one of respect for those who serve in our armed forces and for those who are veterans. So I do want to join colleagues in thanking those in our armed services for all that they do and as several speakers have said today it's not just people's time in service, but afterwards too, because many move on and use their skills in significant ways in our communities and also our economy. So I do think we should celebrate that as well. And I want to flag that, like others, I went to the excellent briefing last night with young people uh, whose parents are or were in the armed services because it gave a really interesting perspective on their lives and what it's like to be in an armed services family potentially the journeys they have to make, uh, the, off, the times they move and their families have to respond to change, living in different places, um, different schools and the challenges of retaining and developing your connections with friends and families. Um, it came across very well and as Claire Baker mentioned, the Ruby Boots project was actually quite inspiring. Um, but I think one of the On things... Point? Briefly, yes. <laughs> very, very briefly. I'm very grateful to Sarah Boyack giving way. And on that point about young people, one of their calls is for the data that surrounds those young people, particularly their school and educational position, to be universal so that their new schools understand what they've done and what they haven't done and they don't have to revisit. Would you agree that that's something we should urge everyone to come behind? Sure, yeah, I, I think that is an excellent uh, point and it did come across at the event last night. Um, young people are actually very well organised and one thing that struck me was that their access to data and digital connectivity is something that they are increasingly using. So it would be good to see schools um, match that approach. Um, one of the things that's come across today a lot is that the transition from being in the armed services and returning to civilian life is not always easy nor straightforward and a lot more needs to be done both to support our veterans and as uh, you've just commented Mr Whitfield our the, ve the veterans families as well because those years in service can come at a personal cost in terms of people's health and well-being so it's more important than ever that we see the collaborative partnerships that are referenced in the Scottish Government's motion today actually being put into place between uh, the public sector, the private and third sectors, and to ensure that the veterans and armed forces community gets the best possible support and access to services. Supporting uh, health and well-being is absolutely essential. The transition to new lives needs housing in the right place and employment opportunities being available. And those were key issues where there was agreement right across the chamber today, which I think is important. There was also a lot of comments about the excellent work done by local organisations. I thought Paul Sweeney's points about Glasgow's Helping Heroes and the fantastic work they do was particularly important. But actually, right across the country, you can see those organisations. And as Ivan McKee mentioned, just across the road, we have... Uh, the Whiteford House, which is run by the Scottish Veterans Housing Association and has supported and provided homes for veterans for decades. And then there's also the work by Site Scotland in my region. Their new lawn bowling team competed in the Vision Impairment Bowling Scotland League, with matches taking place all over Scotland. And their newly created charity team took part in its first league match recently 
at the Jessfield Bowling Club in Portobello in Edinburgh. Now, you might not think that's important, but actually when you read some of the briefing by groups like Site Scotland, the social and cultural connections for veterans with visits and opportunities for people to take up new life experiences and inclusive activities is absolutely critical. And their work to enable digital connectivity to access new skills or relearn vital life skills is absolutely crucial, particularly for those who've lost their sight through their service. One of the issues that came up several times was the important work of the Veterans Commissioner and her contribution on health and wellbeing, employment and skills is welcome. But I do want to uh, repeat the comments that have been made by others about the two areas where she felt more progress is urgently needed. As Paul Sweeney commented, the slow progress in delivering mental health and wellbeing support is something that I hope the Scottish Government will pick up um, because veterans may have experienced what for us would be unimaginable pressures and they need to be supported. Willie Rennie made some insightful comments about the importance of support. But one of the issues I want to, to wind up on um, near the end of my comments is about the homelessness prevention pathway for veterans. It was produced last year, but as the Commissioner said, little has been achieved to date and progress in implementing this much needed pathway is slow, with no clear milestones or timelines provided. So I hope, Minister, that's something that's been raised by several colleagues across the Chamber. Dedicated housing needs investment and it is important. A brief comment, yes. Briefly, I'm grateful for giving way. I think she will have noted from my opening comments that the Housing Minister, Paul McLennan, has committed to meet with the Commissioner to hear her views and to take those forward. Sarah Boyack. I very much welcome that, but uh, three of our colleagues totally in Edinburgh raised the issue of the need for affordable housing, so it has to be a now issue with actual investment. Moving forward, I think we need to see effective underpinning of the Armed Forces Covenant. In our 2021 manifesto, Scottish Labour called for statutory targets to implement the Covenant and support the recommendations of Poppy Scotland in their manifesto um, and the other veterans charities that have made lobbying really important. If Labour was elected next year, we would fully incorporate the Armed Forces Covenant into law because we think it's important in terms of respect moving forward. I asked one of my constituents what his recommendations would be. He firstly mentioned the Covenant and said how important it was, but he then talked about recognising the importance of veterans going forward, raising better awareness amongst business of the skills that ex-forces can bring is therefore important and likely good for the economy, he said. Service personnel are measured and trained for their courage, commitment, respect, discipline, integrity, loyalty and leadership, not to mention communication, positivity and flexibility. Who wouldn't want more of that in their organisation? I think his words are very well made and I hope that our businesses who are listening today will pick up on those fantastic veterans who have skills and talent that they can offer us. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity today to thank all the 250,000 veterans across Scotland who have bravely and selflessly served our country. We owe them an enormous debt of gratitude for all they've done to protect us, to defend our United Kingdom and to serve the entire country whenever called upon. We also owe a huge thanks to their families who can see their own lives upturned through the service of their loved one. And I think we've heard a lot of that in the contributions today. Since becoming an MSP in 2021, it's been a great privilege to meet with current members of the Armed Forces, veterans and their families on several occasions. I was delighted to get the opportunity to visit the Royal Navy's Recife Dockyards to tour the HMS Prince of Wales and speak with sailors and marines about Scottish shipbuilding and the incredible work they do to keep us safe. Earlier this year, I was blown away by the operations of the RAF at Lossiemouth when I was given the chance to see their operations up close and hear about how they protect our skies and seas 24-7, 365 days a year. I've also been immensely proud to support Poppy Scotland appeals both here and in Ayrshire. And I would encourage anybody who can to continue giving their time and money to help that organisation give veterans the help they deserve. And I know that many MSPs across the Chamber have felt similarly when visiting armed force bases and veterans charities. This was mentioned by Graham Day in his contribution and he also had the privilege 
of paying his respects in northern France to those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Paul Sweeney also mentioned a number of bases he's had the privilege of visiting, and Pam Gosell also spoke about being invited to the ceremonial bricklaying for Scotland's first Indian Army memorial. But as we all recognise, it's not enough for us as MSPs to merely thank veterans and hear their words. We must translate our words into action. We must give them every support we can as they transition into civilian life. And I'm pleased we can all recognise across every party the huge importance and contributions of veterans in our society. And I think that was um, a point that was made quite clear by Sarah Boyack in her closing up there. In their service and in everyday lives afterwards, they are integral parts of communities across Scotland. The Scottish Government's Veteran Strategy Action Plan is positive, as is the UK Government's. And it is fantastic to see both of Scotland's governments working together on the delivery of these plans for the benefit of veterans across Scotland and the UK. Of course, we can also recognise that more needs to be done for veterans. Life is far from perfect for many of them in Scotland today. Last year alone, over 800 veterans made a homeless application and around 100 of those ended up sleeping rough. We can all, as one parliament, see that is unacceptable and commit to preventing that happening again. Willie Rennie said in his con contribution that we need a pathway that is timely and effective and we can't be slow to take action. So what more must be done for veterans? I want to thank the detailed and diligent work of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, Susie Hamilton, who has produced very welcome and in-depth assessments of the Scottish Government's progress. And I had the pleasure of meeting her at a recent combat stress event, and I think her knowledge, experience and passion are, are clear to see. Um, and as Edward Mountain mentioned in his contribution, I'd like to thank the previous Commissioners as well and thank them for their work. As the Commissioner said, this year's report has shown some really encouraging progress, particularly in the area of health and wellbeing. As others have noted, the Commissioner looked at the Government's 81 recommendations and found 35 have already been achieved and a further 21 have been absorbed into subsequent recommendations. That is good news, especially the improvements at general practices which have helped veterans access the treatment they need more quickly. As the Commissioner noted, tackling the issues that those with polytrauma face has the potential to transform the lives of the most seriously injured veterans. However, as I mentioned earlier, there are still serious problems to overcome when it comes to homelessness prevention and mental health. It found, I quote, progress in delivery has been slow and over the 2021 Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan. The Commissioner raised concerns that veterans' needs are not being met in this area and it must become more of a priority. Christine Graham had mentioned in her contribution about the two-week period that servicemen have to readjust after a tour before they go back home because of the experiences that they've had when they're away on tour. Similarly, the delivery of the veterans' homelessness prevention pathway has not been successful to date. The Commissioner noted, and I quote, little has been achieved to date and progress in implementing this much-needed pathway is slow, with no clear milestones or timelines provided. To quickly go into contributions. Uh, Megan Gallagher <laughs> spoke of war memorials and how it was a focal point for us to remember. She also spoke of the 66 occasions where they've been damaged, and she's right, this shouldn't be happening. It's a focal point not only for us, but also for members of their family, so it's something that we need to take action on. Audrey Nicholl spoke of education and employment and the facilities that are in the North East to help uh, veterans in her area. And I think it's something that we need to be more vocal on is to make sure that everybody knows about the help that is out there for veterans just now. Claire Baker mentioned Ruby Boots, which helps children when their parents leave the forces. And I think quite a few of us were privileged to meet some of the children last night at the event in Parliament. Um, Ivan McKee also mentioned the Scotch Scottish veterans' residencies, with three in Scotland, one in his constituency and another in Dundee and Edinburgh, um, which doesn't provide just housing but other various support as well. And again, that's more of the support that we need to make sure that everybody is um, aware of. 
Alex Rowley spoke of the previous lack of data and how we've made progress in that. Um, and on that, we need to make sure that we use the data that we get to make sure that we're getting better outcomes for veterans. Uh, and Keith Brown, in his contribution, mentioned the medal replacement scheme and to get as much publicity as we can. And as I'm sure as MSPs, we can all publicise that on our social media to make sure that it does get the publicity that it deserves. On the two areas, mental health and homelessness, I urge the government to make urgent progress for veterans. They must do so because people affected by those issues are the most vulnerable and often the ones most in need of help. As it stands, they are sadly not receiving the help they deserve. If the government's actions are measured by what it does for the most in need, then in that area, they have a long way to go. I welcome the nature of the debate today and we are happy to support the government's motion, but I must press them to deliver their veteran strategy in full by meeting the expectations of the Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan and Veterans Homelessness Prevention Pathway. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Graham Day to wind up the debate. A very generous 10 minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I too can read the clock. Um, uh, President Officer, members, uh, I want to thank members for the contribution today. There were some really valuable points raised. And in closing, I'm going to try and prioritise responding to some of the key ones in the time that I have available. Um, on Christine Graham and Claire Baker's point about support for those veterans engaged in the justice system but not actually in prison, uh, where there is support provided, I'm not entirely sure of the scale of this issue, but it is something that's on the radar of the Justice Secretary and myself. At present, uh, as we've heard, there's no explicit preset question asking people uh, being considered by the court for community sentences or serving sentences if they actually served in the armed forces. And as we know from those who are in prison, very often veterans are too ashamed to reveal uh, their history after falling foul of the law. So even if there is a question, they may not answer it. Um, but in terms of what could be done if we did have such information, I would hope the new Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Pathway might provide a route for assisting this cohort. But I will feed the concerns that uh, Claire Baker and Christine Graham have raised into the associated work stream. So those that are taking forward delivery uh, are alive to capturing uh, such individuals. Edward Mount made a number of excellent points, though Maggie Chapman subsequently... Uh... Claire Baker. <coughs> um, thank you very much. I appreciate the Minister's comments on the data issues I raised, but I did raise the issue of blue badges. I appreciate the Minister is not the sole Minister involved here at Social Security and Transport, but if he could get commitment that he'd maybe go away and look at this. I know he's corresponded with my constituent, but I, he does recognise there's a difference between the threshold in England and Scotland. Minister. President Officer, I, I will commit to, to, to look at that. Um, Edward Mount made a number of excellent points, although Maggie Chapman subsequently took him to task for his misplaced comment regarding his anticipation of the Green Party's participation in the, the debate. I hope he's suitably chastised. Um, amongst other things, uh, he focused on resettlement, something Ivan McKee picked up on too. One aspect, though, that Edward Mountain missed out on, of course, was that of early service leavers. We tend, and understandably so, to focus in this space on families, and, and I absolutely understand that. But sometimes the most challenged and challenging cohort in resettlement is often those who are single and with only a very limited period of service behind them, often recruited from difficult backgrounds and from areas that they actually don't want to return to. I don't pretend to have the answer on this point, but it does require a degree of focus. Uh, I wish Willie Rennie well in his recovery from COVID, but on his point re service pupil premium, and he's, I know he has a strong constituency interest in this, I'm still not persuaded of the need for this. Will Rennie noted there are 2,500 young people in Scotland within service families, but whilst recognising the potential impact of deployment or upheaval from uh, rebasing, I want to see evidence of how many of these young people are impacted in a way which they would not be able to secure appropriate support for uh, from the generally available services within school, particularly where that school has a strong understanding of the needs of that cohort. But if through the National Education Officer evidence, and I stress evidence, emerges of a proven detriment being experienced, then of course we would look with partners at how that might be addressed. I think, President Officer, we do have a track record in responding to evidence issues in the education space, 
because on the back of responses received from armed forces, families and representative groups, we made changes to ensure FE funding is available for all service children based in Scotland, and that applies to spouses and partners too. Um, Paul Sweeney, amongst other things, noted the issue of accessible childcare close to bases. Uh, as he knows, Scotland is the only part of the UK to offer 1,140 hours a year of funded ELC to all three- and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds. And as we announced in PFG, we will expand access to funded childcare for 13,000 more children and families by the end of this Parliament. But we are alive to the issues facing serving families following the introduction of wraparound 20 hours a week childcare uh, funded, uh, funded by the MOD for four to 11 year olds. In fact, I discussed this quite recently with Rich Knight and the head of the Air Service and have agreed to visit Lossiemouth with, with him in due course to hear more about the challenges being encountered. But Keith Brown made a valid point on this around where MOD uh, policy, often developed with no consultation with devolved governments, can create a need locally with no regard for how that is met. And uh, finally, President Officer, the uh, Gordon Highlanders Museum got an honourable mention from Jackie Dunbar and Audrey Nicholl, and rightly so. And having said that, I better declare an interest as my grandfather's medals are on display there. Um, President Officer, I want to move on, moving towards the conclusion of this debate. I want to focus um, on giving a little bit more of a flavour of some of our priorities over the next year. As I said in my opening remarks, Examining the and acting upon veterans' data is going to be a major priority, a priority for us throughout the next 12 months and beyond. And I hope that next year I'll be able to return to the Chamber and share some insights from the Census and the various other surveys which contained veterans-related questions. We have made progress up until now in ensuring we can get access to diverse sets of data from a number of different sources, but it's now even more important to do something with it. As Alec Rowley highlighted, access to rich and varied data sets will allow us to determine the issues which matter most to veterans and their families and where improvements to support or service delivery need to be made. This in turn will better inform where we should be focusing our efforts. I am hopeful that good quality evidence will also help us to continue to change the narrative on veterans and further improve perceptions around some of the issues that can perhaps sometimes be exaggerated, sensationalised or misunderstood. I spoke about this earlier, but I highlight again that the vast majority of veterans and their families reintegrate back into civilian society perfectly well and go on to lead their lives without significant issue. We should collectively focus more of our attention on the positive contributions they make to society rather than the often inaccurate negative perceptions. For example, in the UK Government's recent study of perceptions of UK Armed Forces veterans, there was a feeling that ex-service personnel may struggle to reintegrate into civilian society. Respondents particularly associated veterans with issues such as homelessness. And I don't shy away from the fact there is an issue. However, we know from existing data that veterans are no more likely to be homeless than the, veteran, the, the general population. And noting the positive contributions of the armed force weavers does not represent any attempt to deflect from our responsibility, our collective responsibility, to those who have been left with legacy challenges from their service. Rather, it seeks to address the frustration many within the cohort feel about how they are characterised, particularly in the media. Um, Uh, Susie Hamilton, um, I, I spoke earlier, President Officer, about the Scottish Veterans Commissioner's annual progress report. Uh, but this year we also welcomed uh, her new three-year strategic plan. And this Susie Hamilton describes uh, what she intends to focus on during her tenure as Commissioner. She highlights three specific areas, namely community and relationships, with a particular focus on women and LGBT veterans, uh, veterans uh, and the law, looking at, amongst other things, whether the right support is in place for veterans in the criminal justice system, which perhaps goes back to Claire Baker and Christine Graham's point, and finance and debt, looking at the advice, the guidance and support provided to veterans as they return to civilian life. I was really pleased that she aligned her activity to the themes of the veterans' strategy, and the elements of her work will also complement Lord Etherton's independent review. I look forward to engaging in and supporting fully her work, and we stand ready to respond as necessary. Finally, on the subject of the veterans' strategy, we continue to be guided by our strategy action plan and the commitments contained within it, some of which I have been pleased to provide 
and a, an update on. And I, and I reiterate, uh, I recognise in my opening comments uh, where we have received criticism for a couple of aspects of progress, and we are working towards delivering on that. Um, Alec Rowley was right when he said that whilst the report card would acknowledge very good progress made, uh, it was also true to say that more needs to be done. I fully accept that. But, President, officer, as ever, there is more to do, uh, and we're still working on elements of our plan which will continue to evolve, mature, and respond to the needs of our veterans and their families, particularly in light of the raft of data coming our way. It may be that we have to change direction in certain respects, depending on what the evidence tells us. I won't shy away from that and stick unnecessarily to a particular approach if it's no longer fit for purpose. And I know that my ministerial colleagues across government will share that view. We have to be ready to adapt flexibly to the needs of our veterans and entire armed forces community. Of course, any such decisions, I say, on changing the direction or approach would be taken in conjunction with the relevant ministerial uh, uh, colleagues across government, because this is a cross-government responsibility. President mm -hmm. Officer, finally, it's vitally important that this chamber continues to have the opportunity to scrutinise our performance and how we are delivering as a government for our veterans, their families and the entire armed forces community in Scotland. But I recognise there are limits to the time the Bureau can or will afford us for such purposes. That's why, as Martin Whitfield alluded to earlier, I've committed to regular veterans drop-in sessions for members of myself and officials in order that they can raise any issues with us between debates or statements in the Chamber and also offer thoughts on how we might improve our offering to veterans, serving personnel and their family. Because, President Officer, today has once again served to remind us that this is a subject that we can make common cause on right across this Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on support for the veterans and armed forces community. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 10767 on substitution on committees. And I ask Gillian Mackay on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Moved, presiding officer. Thank you. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of standing orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite Martin Whitfield to move the motion. And moved. Thank you. And the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business, and the first is that motion 10743 in the name of Graham Day on support for the veterans and armed forces community be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 10767 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on substitution on committees be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed and that concludes decision time and I close this meeting.